the title of the talk and this handout, which is, has a few years under its belt, but it's still worth it, is called Creating and Caring for Your Native Garden. Native garden or natural garden, whatever you want to call it. And if you want to, uh, you know, cram for the test and, and hope for the best, like I used to do, try to read the last chapter and think you could wing it through the book report. Um, sometimes it worked. <laughs> Uh, you can get to the last page, and we'll just start there. Um, that is kind of the, the spirit behind all of this, the rewards that come with natural gardening and native plant gardening. You know, in, in a great book about a relationship that people have with a plant called sweetgrass, and the name of the book is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Kimner, hyphen something else, can't remember, sorry. Um, Wall, Kimner Wall, she talks about reciprocity, which is this idea of this mutual relationship where both parties benefit. The garden, of course, you're taking care of the garden, and the garden is taking care of you in a very real sense because you gain from it uh, a connection to nature, now that we're talking about native plants and naturalistic plantings, that you need, we need, every day and we can't have it every day in the culture we live. We can go on vacation, we can go out for a day hike, we can drive into the hills, we can do whatever it takes to connect to nature as often as possible. But if you have a natural garden outside your door, you literally have an opportunity to do it every day. And this becomes even more important for small children because they live in small spaces, and so the backyard or the front yard becomes for them this wild place. And so every lizard and every pollinating insect and every time a flower blooms, and little things change, they can be part of that and so can you. So that's what the garden is giving back and it's really worth it to put in what you need to put in and none of it is work. It's all engagement. It's all quite fun as a matter of fact. If you look on our blog and see May in the natural garden, I make a comparison to celebrations and I've thought this way, that a routine task like pruning a ceanothus can become in your mind, kind of a ritual. Are you going to do this every May? And from ritual, you can make it into a ceremony. I don't want to get too crazy here on you, but you know, this, this is an idea about now, I, I'm privileged to have this relationship with this ceanothus and trim off the old seed heads and shape it and tend it and be part of its well-being. And from ceremony, you go to celebration. And to make this point, I quote a famous author called um, Bird Baylor out of Arizona. She just died at the age of 97. And she wrote children's books mostly. You can find them. And she wrote one great children's book called I'm in Charge of Celebrations. And it's a very endearing book, which I quote in the May in the Natural Garden. So look, at, look that up. And it's about a girl who makes her own celebrations based on what she sees in nature in addition to the ones they let, they close the schools for, quote. So it's, uh, you make your own celebrations from ceremony, if you will, from ritual, which means just a repeated activity, which started with routine. So I don't think you can get there with mowing the lawn. I don't think you can make celebrating mowing the lawn a real thing. But I, <laughs> but I think you can on hands and knees down pulling a few weeds and looking at the lizard scat and adjusting some leaf mulch and then noticing a, uh, a, a cool beetle or something. I think you can make weeding um, on hands and knees in your uh, natural garden something to celebrate. All right, so that's a, about a state of mind and it goes to this engagement, this idea that we get into this, um, this, this uh, uh, activity called horticulture. And it's a proven fact with data and science, that um, aromatherapy, uh, the, the oils, and the, this idea that the, the, in the um, Asian countries they've been doing forest bathing and documenting it since the 80s. They've been doing it for millennia, but they've documented it since the 1980s, how the oils and the things, the, the scents, the aromas in the natural pine forest works in the desert, it works here, it works in your garden. And so not only the physical activity, but the breathing of that air, the calming experience, just the idea that connection to nature is very healing, and that's documented and known. It's also documented and known that gardening and 
and you know whether it's roses or vegetables or herbs or flowers is a healthy activity when you put the two together that's horticulture gardening and nature like as in natural stuff and you have a natural garden it's a win-win you can't go wrong you're going to be well and you're going to get well and you're going to stay well in that garden so that's the last chapter of the of the of the book and and the one that means sort of why you're here and that's why we thank you for being here you took your saturday morning to get here so for some reason you want a natural garden around you and it might be as as simple a reason as i want to save water because now all the water districts are freaking out again happens every now and then and it's real this time the reservoirs have never been this low the vegetation has never been this dry we've never been this hot we had 100 degrees, over 100 degrees, two days in April, 95 yesterday. It's going to push 100 today. It's crazy, and it's crazy dry. So saving water is a real deal, but the water districts all up and down the state, especially in Southern California, are on freak-out mode because the um, reservoirs aren't there to provide water, and it's only May. Well, those plants across the way where the natural hills are, they're not freaking out. You know, they're a little drought-stressed, and they've been that before and there'll be that again, and hopefully we'll get some normal rains someday. But your garden is where you can obviously save a lot of water by not watering. I'm gonna make, make a big placard that says, you don't save water by watering. <laughs> you save water by not watering. It's about not watering. So does that mean that you don't water your native plants at all? No, it does not mean that at all. But I'm gonna get into how efficient these plants are at using water and then how to keep them looking just a little bit better than those dry hills from a gardening standpoint. Those dry hills look just fine to me in the middle of summer, but it won't pass through the HOA. So by just adding a little bit of judicious water, you can have a green lush garden all the time with one tenth or maybe one fifth the amount of water that it takes to keep a typical ornamental landscape alive at least half the water of what it takes to keep a garden that touts itself to be water conservation style garden. So I'm saying if you have succulents that you can keep your native plant garden uh, healthy and more beautiful and more functional with about 25% the water that succulents need. So, you know, we'll go, we'll go all the way. If during the talk, during the period of the talk, I get a little bit cynical about the landscape industry and the horticultural industry that we see all around us, the center medians, the slopes, the, the way that commercial landscapes are operated. Um, uh, it, it's because I'm cynical. <laughs> I'm not going to make any excuse. I'm done um, uh, tiptoeing around this issue. Those are not good examples of how to take care of gardens, okay, period. When you see what's happening with a white truck parked in the street, orange cones out there and people with bright colored vests on, just put your blinders on because harm is being done to plants on, on that scene and, it's, and it hurts. This is not because they are evil people or they do not um, care about plants. It's, it's largely men who work hard every day for their job and, they, and I honor them. I speak fluent Spanish so I could communicate with most all of them. And, um, I don't have a problem with them. <laughs> I have a problem that no one has trained them or taught them what they're supposed to do in this garden and why. So power equipment gets started, prunes get, uh, uh, plants get hacked, and we get to watch uh, perfectly innocent plants turn into little round balls and squares and rectangles when that's not how they want to grow at all. Cynical? Yes. Main point, that's not our baseline example for how to take care of plants. We're going to do it right, and when we do, we're going to celebrate this, this beautiful garden. Okay, so how many people here are literally trying to start from scratch? Going to start with a brand new garden either? Yes, good. Okay, so you're going to tear out something that's existing, or do you have bare dirt? Dirt, dirt new home, right? Or you already tore it out? Tore it out. Tore it out. Good. Congratulations. I'm sheet mulching. Sheet mulching to kill everything. Yeah. Tur turf mainly. Okay, yeah, turf replacement. Okay, excellent. Okay, you're on it. Thank you for coming. It's May. My high, my, the, the best recommendation I can give you, and I'd love to sell you a bunch of plants today, would be methodically get your place ready for a, for a fall planting. 
you can put a few plants in for your own, you know, enjoyment, just so that you know you haven't abandoned your garden, just to make that little green plant make you happy. But I'm going to ask you to just do all, really precise and careful site prep, and that's killing, that's rocks, that's mounds, that's irrigation system, if any, that's testing the irrigation. You can even sprout some weeds using irrigation and then kill them off with pulling them or sheet mulching or whatever. And you can, you can get this place so ready for a late September, early October planting. And it will just save you a lot of stress because we're already getting so hot. Now, if you live close to the coast and you want to plant something now, we can help you for sure. Even if you live inland, we can help you plant a few things now. If you've got an HOA that's, that's um, you know, the clock is ticking on why they can't handle brown dirt until October, tell them to call me. Um, you, obviously, yes, you, depending on your site, you can start planting. But I mean, the wholesale construction of your garden is so much more successful in the fall. Because what we've got coming are longer days, hotter days, no rain. And so what you end up doing is you're taking care of individual plants. Now, if you're prepared to do that, we'll get into it in a minute, with a, a hose and a, and a soft rain nozzle, no irrigation system is going to take care of your brand new garden that you plant in June because it is watering everything and lots evaporating and it's not going very deep and it's but it, but in in each planting hole if you go around and take care of the individual plants during the summer you're going to be okay so we'll get into that when we get into watering so i'm just saying we're right on the cusp it's not too late like if it was july it'd be a no-brainer just wait till october okay but it, but it is uh may and and you can buy a lot of time with just enjoy if you have a patio and you want some potted plants and that's going to be part of your new world come fall buy those plants now and take care of them in pots and have your hummingbirds coming to the dudley and to the things all summer long we'll help you get there but it would be really to your advantage to plant in the cool season and have hundred percent success and do it easier than to struggle or to struggle a lot if you want to struggle a little bit, it's worth it. So on your site prep, you want to make sure that there's soil moisture. And soil moisture means moist down to a depth of about 18 inches. Between 8 and 18, and then a little deeper even, is where most of the feeder roots are for plants. They're up near the, fairly close to the surface, not right at the surface. But believe it or not, even the feeder roots that are taking care of these oaks are way out beyond their drip line, which is the place where the Will rain the, the, the vertical line between the edge of the canopy of the tree to the soil. That's called the drip line. And there are roots, and they're only about this deep. Now, this tree with this huge structure has deep, big, thick anchor roots that are holding it in place. And there are feeder roots on those as well. But typically, the majority of the actual plant nutrition and feeding is taking place in this zone that has oxygen as well, because roots need moisture and nutrients and oxygen and technically dark <laughs> so so they grow that's what they kind of need that's that's what good soil offers so you want your moisture in your soil to be consistent at a depth of 8 to 18 inches in other words if you dig a hole in your garden or anywhere that you're going to do planting and it's dry down six inches that's okay possibly keep digging if it's still dry because we've had two years of not normal rainfall then you need to start soaking the ground slowly in order to get water to penetrate deep before you start planting. But how you make the water penetrate deep, we'll get into when we get to watering. Weeds, if you have weeds, in a way that's a good sign because it means the soil will support plant growth. If they are Bermuda and nutgrass and sedge and other very tenacious weed species that, that are uh, almost impossible, very, very difficult to control. Come talk to me um, on the side and we'll deal with that. If they're just these wimpy little weeds that come up from seed every winter and then every summer, they can be brought out, but taken out with a hoe or pulled out or starved out or um, uh, sheet mulch or whatever it takes to do that. And then you got to get rid of varmints. You got to at least know that deer and gopher, if you're having that sort of world of deer, rabbits, squirrels, dogs, cats, etc., may be an issue and you got to sort of prepare for that because it's very sad to take 
a whole bunch of plants home from the nursery and plant them. And then like the first night, the bunnies just wipe you out. So you just want to know if they're there and what to do to, to take care of that. So that, that's kind of the beginnings of site prep is concentrating on moisture. If you're starting from scratch or even not, know this, that in a small space, microtopography, mounds, swales, little half moon crescents that hold on to water, anything that, that varies the, 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 the topography from just being a flat space makes it more interesting, way more interesting from a design standpoint. It gives you a place to put boulders and rocks to shore up these mounds and make it look like you know, a hill. And the plants do really well, and if they're constructed right, your garden will capture and absorb more rainfall and more irrigation, sprinkle irrigation, and so everything's more efficient with topography than just flat. If that's a, you can make topography by digging a swale, that's a dry stream bed that takes water from a source, maybe the gutter of the roof, out to the street, or from runoff, local runoff into the swale. But in digging the swale, you've got some dirt because you've just dug a little natural, certain, don't, not a trench, but you've dug a little creek bed. Well, then spill that dirt out on both sides of it or more on one side than the other and create mounds. And if that's not enough, then look for a source of really high quality topsoil that you can import and build mounds and start you know, getting some topography, some elevations into your garden. It really, really makes everything more interesting. And depending on the theme of your garden, because we haven't really talked about that, but you need one, then you de that will help determine what kind of soil to import. If you were going to build a desert garden, you know, straight up want this to look like the Sonoran Desert, then you're going to want to bring in some very loose, sandy, almost decomposed granite style um, soil, or at least the top dress of that, so that you have that look. But for the most part, just a good topsoil, and we can talk to you about how to get that and where it is. Okay, so that's, that's your site prep. When I, when I mention just briefly your theme, I, I really want to emphasize, and it's not so much in this book about um, planning, because this is more uh, uh, straight up um, pragmatic things to do in the garden. But when you're challenged with the idea of a brand new garden, um, and three or four parties here are, and I'm so happy to hear that, what you want to do is uh, think about what story you're trying to tell in your garden. Okay? It's about your lifestyle and your likes and dislikes. So think of whatever it is that place in California you like the most or makes you the happiest or brings back the best memories. And if, if it's possible to replicate that in your small garden, at least in your mind, that's your theme. So if you like the local environment, this chaparral coastal sage scrub, that becomes your theme. If you like the desert, you know, that becomes your theme. If you like grasslands and oak woodland and sort of savanna, peaceful flower fields, that becomes your theme. If you like forest, if you say, I love the mountains, that becomes your theme. Hopefully, the theme that from your garden also matches or somehow complements the architecture of your home and uh, the entrance in and your interior decoration, etc., so that there's some continuity. But the, you need, a, you need a, a, a context, a theme, a story that you're telling, and it makes choosing plants and other amenities, whether it be wood benches or rocks or a fountain, a bird bath, a yeah, bench, it makes whatever you, happens out in that garden simple because, it, it, because now you have a design theme. I, I, again, you don't see this very often in outdoor landscape design at the commercial level today. You see it done very well quite often interior and many architects really nail it. They'll build a building like a bank or something and they'll say, okay, it's Spanish style. We're in some town in Southern California that's got the word rancho on it. Let's build a Spanish style thing. So there's tile roof, there's arched windows, there's white stucco, there's brick patio. The whole thing looks like a million bucks. It's, it's good. It looks good. You go inside and they've got plein air paintings and it's kind of dark. It looks like old California. They've got some leather furniture. They nailed it. Okay. Go outside. Same old, same old plants. Landscape architect didn't think that this is about a California story. They just put in whatever to make it green. And it's sickening. So you don't want to do that. You want to take your story out to your garden. All right. So we've got site prep. And now a soil amendment. Now, many people think that you have to get the soil ready to plant plants. In a way, yes. But more than that, you have to choose plants that will grow in your soil. Because even if you got the soil ready and you spent a ton of money putting 
organic mulch down and compost and you turned it over and you, you, still you're only preparing at great expense and we, don't, we do not uh, recommend this, the soil to a depth of about like this at best and then below that is the real world soil that you, that you have to live with and so do your plants. So don't so much pr prepare soil as prepare the plants, Cho choose the right plants that will grow in your soil and with native plants it's quite easy because uh, there are so many. So what we, what we do when we um, uh, talk about amendment is we like to recommend that uh, the uh, planting hole have an amendment added. And that is because you're going to buy plants in containers from a nursery and they've been growing in a potting mix. Ours is, makes for quite successful planting because it looks and feels and tastes and smells like real soil by the time you get it. Okay, so it's, it's like a real good soil, like a loamy soil, but when you knock the, 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 the plant out of the pot and be careful to never pull on the trunk of the plant, always turn it upside down and let it come out, the, the container is tapered and it comes right out. You have a root system, this is Ramnus californica coffee berry, and it's quite an interesting plant because it actually does have orange roots. So I chose it so you can see them from all over. It's, it's uh, pretty interesting. And these roots are healthy because they're orange and they're turgid, meaning they're full of water, and they break off, and there's no black, um, rotten, uh, ugly, diseased roots in here. And it's not root-bound, and it's well-rooted. And, but this is a potting soil, and out here, if this is your planting hole, out here is the real world, the soil that this plant has to find and love for the rest of its life. So we like to think that in order to make that transition for these little roots here to find their way out of this root ball into the real world soil, if they have this transition zone of amended soil, that's a material that looks like this potting soil blended with the real world soil, about one third compost to two thirds soil. Now, this fluffy material, which is called the backfill, that's what goes back in the planting hole around the root ball, that fluffy material offers these roots a transition zone. It says, come on over here. It's quite a bit like what you're used to. And the root says, yeah, I'll do that. So it comes on over here, but there's real soil in this, in this backfill. And so then the backfill calls out and says, hey, come on over here. It's quite a bit like what you're used to. And the root says, yeah, I think I'll try that too. And it goes on over to the real world soil and then the plant is now established. It's grown out of its root ball and into the real soil that you have. That's what we like to do. Some people are very animate about no amendment. They just want to toss the real soil back into the, into the planting hole around the root ball and tell the plant to you know, cope. And if that works for you, keep doing it. You know, whatever, in horticulture, if you've got a tried and true system that has been working for years for you, and then I say that it's something quite different, maybe try it, but don't have to. Keep doing what you're doing if it works, okay? If the soil that you're putting back in here is decent, good, like we don't amend here at Tree of Life, we've got this unbelievably perfect loam soil all around it. We plant a plant, we just throw it in there, water it, and it takes off. I, I mean, this, this oak was a five gallon oak only three years ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just making sure you're awake out there. So the, uh, but if you have a very poor soil, clay, subsoils, things that have been graded off, uh, not soil at all, like so many of the, uh, what, what houses are left with after the builder walks, because the, quite frankly, the grading was so severe that you're into subsoils, they're not soil, then you really do have to amend that planting hole and you really do have to be careful about the, the types of plants that you choose. So that's the, what we talk about on amendment regarding fertilizer, which is the next thing on the page. We like organic only. We like pre-plant fertilizer, meaning a little handful of fertilizer in the planting hole, in the backfill that is. And we like um, to include a little bone meal in there, which is a good old fashioned way of promoting good roots. Regarding the, the uh, planting hole, and we're up to page four already, planting, the season we've already talked about. And the technique for planting is very important because this is something that is not done right um, by many people, even in the landscape, the commercial trade. And so I want to tell you what I think is right and, and you're, you'll do fine. Okay, back to a root ball. Here's a holodiscus discolor, ocean spray. Beautiful plant. I, 
and here we have its roots. See the root ball holds together, but it's not root bound with roots circling round and round. And there we have it. So what we're gonna know about this root ball of this holodiscus is that our planting hole now for this plant, the old adage is twice as wide and half again as deep. Meaning if this is eight inches wide, we want our planting hole to be 16 inches wide, at least twice as wide and half again as deep. So if this is eight or 10 inches deep, we want it to be half again. So let's call this eight again. So another four. So we would want this planting hole to be 16 inches wide or wider by 12 inches deep, twice as wide and half again as deep. Some people run into a little problem with the half again as deep because if they set the plant in and they don't compact it and allow for a little settling, then as that backfill material under the root ball settles with water and with time, the, the, the root ball sinks into the hole and is now lower than it should be. So if, unless you are careful, the other way to plant, and, it, and many people swear by this, is just make a wide hole with a firm floor that is this deep right here and set the plant on that firm floor. I do that with big trees. When I'm planting box trees, specimens and things like that, I don't like to have the tree, the, the tree sitting on top of a bunch of fluff because that's a big heavy root ball and I really don't want that to sink over time. So uh, we like to have um, a firm floor under a large specimen sized tree, but it's up to you. I like ha twice as deep, half again, twice as wide, half again as deep because I know how to make that bottom mounded and firm and then plant slightly high so that it allows for that little half inch of settling that's gonna happen when, with moisture. <coughs> so you dig that hole, that, those dimensions, then you, sc you score the inside of the hole, the, the, the wall of the hole so that there's not smooth. Take your shovel and just muck it up so that it has um, you know, grooves and, and, and it looks rough not uh, smooth because smooth, especially in clay soils, will create a system of sort of wrapping roots. Okay, now you put uh, water in it, okay? And you're gonna let it soak down so that the water disappears. That might take several minutes or a couple hours, whatever, but it, it's worth it to dig, pre-dig that hole and fill it with water and let that water drain out because now all that water has gone into the soil all around the hole and that's the, the, those soils that are gonna call out to those roots, come on over here. Well, they, the roots won't go if it's dry. <laughs> Here's the thing about roots and water and moist soil. Just like you when you lose your car keys. I, I love this thing, the way I think it. When I lose my car keys, when I find them, I stop looking. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty basic. <laughs> so that's true with roots too. They look for moisture and when they find it, they stop looking. So if there's no moisture out here and all the moisture is in here, because of the way that you're watering now three months after planting, little drip emitter right here next to the, not right, but let's, you see it, okay? And, and so this stays wet, 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 wet. And out here, it's never wet. Those roots aren't gonna explore out there just going on the off chance. Hey, maybe there's some moisture from, you know, further out yonder. <coughs> a few plants do that, by the way. Mesquite in the desert actually does that. It grows on, in, in a stream bed that's dry. And, and it's in a group of plants that finds moisture like 35 feet deep and stuff like that. Phreatophytes, they're called. And so it has this weird mentality of thinking, I'm just gonna go for it. And it goes down through dry soil until it finds you know, perennial moisture 40 feet deep. But that's pretty rare. And there's only a few plants on earth that do that. Most plants don't look for moisture in dry soil and they stop looking for moisture once they find it. So that to say, if you put water in the hole and it penetrates all around, now you've got moist soil for sure. Now you build a little mound in the bottom of this hole because we're going to go with this method of digging it half again as deep, okay? So you build a little mound of backfill and you firm it up and you set the plant root ball atop that mound so that this area, which we're going to call the collar or the crown, is slightly higher than the surrounding grade. The surrounding grade meaning the, the, the dirt level, okay? Slightly higher. And you can eyeball it or you can take a straight stick or something to determine that. <clears throat> the bottom, the, the final product, excuse me, <clears throat> the final product in all this will be, picture your bathroom sink, okay? The drain is in the middle, okay? 
It's also in the lowest spot. That's not what the planting hole is going to look like. The crown or the collar will be in the middle of the hole and when you're finished, but it won't be the lowest spot. It will be slightly higher than the surrounding basin. So if, you're, if, if your sink had the drain slightly higher, the drain would stay, hot, would stay dry while there's water around it. Okay, we're going to get to that. So the, you set the root ball atop the soil mound, and you have the hose running at a trickle. And you're running water in the hole while you're planting. This is what most commercial landscapers do not do, but it's a guaranteed 100% success. You spill the backfill, which you've blended and you've made pretty outside the hole um, with uh, the, the amendment and the fertilizer, including bone meal, and you spill that in while the water's running. Now, with your eyes, because that's the only way we all see, we see that that uh, soil is 100% moist. There's no air pockets, there's no dry spots. And you're backfilling with the hose running, and, and you, so together here comes the soil and water, soil and water and soil and water. It starts to get look a little mucky and muddy, but that's okay, keep going. And then at the very end, here's the dimensions of the hole, remember? I'm, I'm sure you're visualizing all this. If I was demonstrating it, you'd know. And we do have a 10 minute video on the YouTube channel. I like to knock this corner off because, it's, it's, because I don't like it there and because it's, it's topsoil. So I knock this corner off with my shovel so that now my hole is fluted, which is going to bring more water in from outside. So I knock that corner off, it goes into, into the backfill, and pretty soon what I've got is a plant in a hole. No longer is there a hole, it's, it's been backfilled. The collar is slightly higher than the lowest spot. I've got a little basin around here, which now is the lowest spot, and then I've got a little berm out here from the remaining backfill or whatever other soil I can scrape up. So you've got a plant in a basin. If you really want to go for it on a remote site planting, you can dig a little trench like a moat outside that basin and it starts looking like a target, like bullseye with, with rings. But each one of those rings is a basin holding water and allowing it to penetrate deep into the soil so that these roots will find that moisture. So that's at the very end, you can apply some mulch, some high quality chipped bark, not cheap, smelly compost, and, but not too deep. I see it way too deep in most commercial landscapes, just about an inch or so, just to keep it fresh and to keep the moisture in and keep a few weeds out, and nothing mounted up around the collar. So the collar, when you water, the basin fills with water. It, as it penetrates the soil into the what was the planting hole into the, into the root ball area, the collar dries out first. It's like, okay, it's up in the air, because there's a lot of important air exchange that happens in this zone right here. So then the, the, root, the water goes down into the, into the soil and penetrates sideways as well because of the basin, the large oversized basin and the mound, and you can celebrate that you have just planted a plant properly. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that whole? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Okay, on a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I actually, they say, you know, take manhandle this thing, poor, poor plant. If the roots are somewhat um, c constrained, if, certainly if they're root bound, but even on this little coffee berry right here, you know, I wouldn't be afraid to uh, gently sort of take, these, take this corner and, and, and ask these roots to kindly head out, if they would, please. And you see like that, so that now they're kind of got a new direction in life. And then you can take this, um, this little corner here is kind of meaningless. You know, it's just, there's no roots there anyway. So you can take that off and use that in your backfill. And then if there's any roots right on the bottom, you can kind of scratch them. And, tickle them a little bit. And then see, that's kind of more ready for the, for the planting. That's a great question. If the plant is root bound, you know, like coiling roots, it might be time to not plant that plant, especially if it's a long lived tree, because that can really be a problem. But in many or most cases, you can take 
a tool or your fingers and just really work those roots out. And plants are more resilient than we give them credit for in most cases, and, and that will even be okay. So yeah, I like to do that. Um, not with Matilaha poppy though, so they're, they're, and Dendromecon. A couple species that have very delicate root systems and you don't want to be manhandling them at all. You just put that in the thing and give it a little kiss goodnight and, and backfill and, and hope for the best because those plants don't like to have their roots mangled. Okay, so any other questions on this long-winded planting treatise? I, I get, these aren't my books, we belong to Laura. <laughs> I didn't go over these books yet. Just a second. <laughs> okay. We, we did okay. Yes? Um, so you're mentioning like wood chips and mulch on top of what yes. plants in. Is there like a preferred type or? Sure. Um, there something. There? Okay. The, the, yes. The question is a preferred type of wood chips or mulch to go on the top. And that also, this would also apply to mulching, which is down in care and maintenance, so we'll just jump ahead with that. But as far as mulching or putting an organic material around in the planting hole to make the uh, soil hold moisture a little better and to prevent a, little, a few of the weeds, um, we like chunks rather than flakes. But look at this tree is getting by just fine with flakes. This is an oak and it's dropping its own mulch over, over many, many years. And I would call those flakes and sticks that works really well, flakes and sticks. Oak, oak likes that, okay? Chunks, which, are, which I call little bark peb pebbles, walk on bark, you know, half inch bark, works really well because it does the job and it lets water through and air through. Strings, I call them strings, like the po ever popular gorilla hair. I'm not too happy about that. It doesn't work, it doesn't hurt all by itself because it's, it does let air through and it does let water through. I don't like the way it creates habitat for Argentine ants, and um, I don't like its look. Unless I'm planting something that's supposed to look like a shady forest, I really don't like the way gorilla hair looks on the surface of the ground. But that's just me. But here's what doesn't work. A combination of sticks, strings, flakes, and dust. <laughs> that's the cheap mulch that you get and that most people put on. And when you see it, you'll, you'll know it. It's, it, it locks itself up and becomes a impenetrable mat. I've seen it so dry that I'm trying to s deep soak a plant and the mulch is floating like a mattress, you know, just <laughs> three inches of floating dry mulch. When you see that on a job, you know, the plants are in peril. Don't bring it into your garden. If it's there now, remove it before summer. I've tried to make this as simple as possible. I chewed on this for 20 years to figure out how to convey it. Strick, st sticks, strings, flakes, and dust together make a bad mulch. The, the, the chunks by themselves, the sticks by themselves, the flakes by themselves, the strings by themselves, or, or a combination of two in the case of this oak, flakes and sticks tends to work, but from bringing it in for your, on your own, just bags of the half inch mulch, uh, garden uh, chunks are my favorite. Redwood, of course, is what you can normally find, and it is a byproduct of the redwood lumber industry. When they bark, debark the tree at the sawmill, they are able to chip the bark and make it available for horticultural use. So it's, a, it's not sustainable in as much as you, you know, some redwood tree gave its life for your, for your mulch, but it was the bark that came off of the tree that went to the mill that became lumber that turned into the handrail on your deck. So I mean, it's a, it's a use of the redwood plant that, tree that was, that was cultivated for that purpose. The ideal mulch is the mulch that the plant makes itself. So whatever you're doing to mulch your garden is a temporary measure. Yes? I was wondering um, on that note, uh, in terms of like forcing uh -huh. the, the mulch or wood chips, um, you've heard of, I'm sure you've heard of like hip, hip rock? Not really. So it's, it's basically those programs where they they'll usually get like wood chips from the same, like that same day from tree trimming. Oh yeah. And they drop it off for free. Uh huh. Stuff, would you say to avoid it or is it okay to go 
it could be really great. Um, I, I have some friends that are tree pruners, and I ask them specifically if they're if they're chipping up some hardwood like alder, elm, sycamore, you know, and it's and it's single species hardwood chips. I like that, but the mixed pine grass clippings, um, uh, prunings from some shrub, uh, unknown tree sources, uh, and then possible disease and weed seed, it becomes sort of problematic. So I think that there's some dialogue necessary with whoever's delivering it. Where'd this come from? What is it? And, and, um, I, and then you, even then, some mellowing, you know, that brand new green chipped, chipped today, um, it, it, there's a, it's a little hot, you know, even though it's on the surface and it's not technically decomposing like in a compost pile, the green, it, 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 it's gonna generate a little heat. Um, especially when the sun hits it. I'm, I'm not sure I'd like, what about you, Kev? What do you think? Well, chemically, there's going to be gassing out. Yeah, off. yeah. It's going to do weird things. Gassing out, and, and so you want it to be drier than that. And, and, and if possible, single source hardwood rather than pine or, or multi-source um, sh shrubs. But again, it depends on what you're doing with it. If you're, if you're, like if it's a center median and it's 50 year old eucalyptus and you're just trying to clean it up so, it does, so it's not just mud, those trees are not so particular to whatever goes on the surface of the soil. I'm not saying to bring in toxins, but they're, they're established, they're, gonna, you know, they're on their own compared to your little posies that are brand new that day. So I mean, you're, you're gonna have to have high quality material for the first at the beginning. And then as, you get, as the trees get older, the ideal thing for your garden and this tree and the world in general is that the tree knows how to drop leaves continually. It's called an evergreen oak, okay? This is not a deciduous tree. It's not a tree that goes dormant in the winter and drops its leaves. It's an evergreen species. Look at all these leaves on the ground. What's the deal with that? Well, it's continually um, dropping leaves and making new ones. And that's, this is its, what, what is called forest litter tree, or leaf litter. I love that term, leaf litter. And, um, or forest humus or mulch, if you will. And that's the best one. So you're gonna cultivate your garden to make its own mulch, to sh the branches shade its own root zone, and that's an ecosystem. So the, the importation of mulch and the, and the selection of high quality mulch is kind of a one-time, maybe a two-time deal for the first, in, in the first three, four years of your garden's life. And then after that, every time you're down on hands and knees, you're just kind of scraping this stuff around and you're seeing it as just pure gold. It's like a treasure. Wow, my plants, my ceanothus, my manzanita, everything's dropping its own leaves. And I was in the desert in Borrego Springs not long ago and there it was super windy and the Palo Verde were, the flowers were all fall, falling off. And there was a, a, a windrow of it in a gutter that was like 100 feet long and it was this thick of pure yellow bloom Palo Verde flowers that had just fallen onto the parking lot. I went and got bags out of my car and <laughs> bagged the stuff up. Palo Verde is a legume, it's got nitrogen in it. They're yellow, they're kind of pretty. There's a potted plant over there right now with about an inch of Palo Verde mulch, Palo Verde flower mulch. You know, I just thought, wow, this is too valuable to throw away. So you're gonna be able to recognize good high quality organics for your, for your, your soil when you see it and, um, and, and, and bring it into the garden, and you don't, yeah? When you're, so when you're pruning, would you just leave your? When you're pruning, you, if, you want, if you have room to start a little, a little compost pile and turn it a few times, cut it, mash it up small, and turn it, then you're gonna have good top grass, absolutely. So just prune it, chip it up, and leave it yeah. there? Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I'd take it off site, cure it a little bit, and then bring it back in. But if there's diseased wood in there, take that to the trash can. Yes. What about eucalyptus leaves, specifically silver dollar? Do they have oil in them? They do. The, yeah, I found that Ceanothus Yankee Point and quite a few natives that I wasn't aware of w will actually do well under eucalyptus. But as you know, most you, yeah, they're, they're, they're not great. Yeah, it's, it's good material. But, but again, if you cook that, that oil out, you know, with, and it just, compost, well-made compost is like wine, you know, it's really fine stuff, not vinegar, wine. So um, you can make good compost out of those eucalyptus leaves, but it's a matter of really breaking it down. Now it's more of, a, of an amendment than a top dress. See, it's good we're on this topic because the, the horticultural world kind of confuses this, but, but mulch in my, is what we're calling top dress. 
it's the, it's the th stuff you put on the top. Compost is what you put in the ground to, to fluff up the soil when you're planting. Rarely do you put compost on the surface. You might put compost on the surface if you've got seeds that you've just sown or little tiny Disneyland flower plants that you put out all over, you know, four inch lupin and poppy and things. You could put some high, uh, some uh, fine textured compost on the surface there. Yes? I thought that natives didn't really like compost. Natives like everything that every other plant likes because we, they come from a dry uh, climate zone, a Mediterranean climate zone. They're more, especially the ones here in Southern California, they're more accustomed to mineral soils, meaning rocky, sandy, dry, gravelly soils. They are more accustomed to that. And so um, to say they don't like compost is true when you're talking about some of the um, rough and ready, rowdy manzanitas and mountain mahogany and things that are out there in the hills. You put them in a real rich compost soil, they might even coffee berry, things like that, they might um, be s subject to summertime root problems because of excess moisture, hold holding excess moisture and not enough oxygen. But the natives that are in the horticultural trade, the manzanitas, the ceanothus, the coffee berry, the things that are in the trade, if in the case of manzanita, for instance, most of them come from central California and northern California species. And those do like more rainfall, richer soils, more organics. So it's not so much that they don't like it. What, they, what, what, we, what we do with, with compost and with fertilizer and with these treatments of the soil for native plants, if you're in doubt, just do everything by half. You know, look at the fertilizer label, cut the recommendation in half, and you'll be safe. Because natives are more efficient at bringing up nutrients and holding on to moisture. So they, they do not require the same, you know, level of, of fluff and organic and moisture and fertilizer as that bed of begonias, you know, there at Mickey Mouse on the Disneyland entrance. That's amazing soil, but you don't put manzanita in that soil. <laughs> okay, so that's an excellent, excellent point. Okay, so that that's really covers mulch and compost at the same time on the, on the new planting. Watering, we've talked a little bit about. I'm going to give you the, 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 the bottom line quickie on it. And you can look at our another, another bro brochure we have called Watering Native Plants. You want a deep water, seldom. And that means like as, it, you can get your garden down to where you're giving it one deep watering a year or two or three, maximum five. So you, if you watered once a month, uh, dur during the dry months, deep, that would be a recommended watering schedule for natives. So that's maybe May, let's call it June, July, August, September, October, right in there. Four to five irrigations a year, soaking it deep. And in between, what we call refreshing sprinkles. So the deep soak, we're talking about an established garden. This garden has roots all around, all through the whole, everywhere. No, not too many new plants. We'll get to new plants in a minute. So plant roots everywhere you're going to run a sprinkler either by hand, by putting this on the end of the hose and running it for several hours in order to get the water to penetrate deep and the air, oxygen especially, in the air to follow directly behind the water into the pores of the soil around each soil particle. That's the best way to water. So whatever your sprinkler system is, let's consider you don't have one, so you're gonna put these out there by hand. Now we're going to put about an inch of water, the equivalent of an inch of rain on the garden. When it rains an inch, it's a nice rain. When it rains a couple inches, you know, well, you know, but then you start seeing a lot of runoff. If it rains a half an inch, it's like, eh, we'll take it, it's better than nothing. We didn't get very many good rains this year, you know, at an inch, inch and a half per event. So it's getting hard to remember what they're like. But it's a nice rain, believe me. It usually doesn't come all at once. So in order to put about an inch of water onto your garden, you're going to have to run the sprinklers, whatever it takes to do that. And your sprinkler has a model number and a make, and you can look online, and it gives what's called the precipitation rate per hour. So if it says three quarters of an inch an hour, then you know if you leave it on slightly longer than an hour, you're going to get an inch of, of precipitation, or five-eighths of, it'll say, and that's based on the proper spacing and no wind, and you know, there's some factors, but you can know what's called the precipitation rate of your sprinkler system, and then you can, by accordingly, 
uh, adjust the time that you're going to water in order to get an inch of water into the ground. This particular sprinkler is on the, connected to a garden hose and it puts out very, very fine droplets in a circle that you can regulate by turning the hose up or down to something so small as this, which is almost immeasurable in inches, but you're just watering one plant, to a circle about eight feet across, eight foot um, radius, about 15 feet across or so. And that's its full thing. I like somewhere in between there. And it's putting out by the manufacturer's spec, about an eighth of an inch of water per hour. So this is really gentle, like a mist almost. Like not, it's more than a mist. It's a very, very fine rain, okay? So you just said, you just did the math because you all went, you know, graduated and everything. It's, uh, uh, that's eight hours of water. <laughs> How are you gonna do eight hours of water to get an inch of precipitation onto your soil. Well, you're going to do it in three consecutive days. You're going to put it on for a couple hours or so, you know, on day one at six in the morning, and, and, and everybody's happy. And the wet water went down this deep because you put on about, you know, a third of an inch or something like that, a quarter inch, whatever. And then the next day at six in the morning, you're going to do the same thing. And now that new water is going to find this wet zone and, and sl slip right through it, because that's how rain works. It, once, these, once there's moisture in these pore spaces, this new moisture just goes, whew, loves it, and going to go a little deeper. And then the third day, a little deeper, and by, the third, by day three, by the way, there's other things going on. While the water's off, the water's still going down by gravity, the water's going sideways by what's called cap capillary action, unless you're in England, then it's capillary. Um, but it's just the same. It's going, it's, it, the water's doing cool stuff in the soil under this regime, just like it does with rain. So after day three, you now have moisture down this deep. You've put about an inch on. If you're in a dry land and your soil and your plants are well established and you know, you might want to put on a little bit more than an inch, you know, it feels good. But about three consecutive days of whatever the soil can take, if it's not one of these sprinklers and it's a conventional sprinkler head, you might only have to run it 20 minutes or 10 or 15 on day one and 15 on day two and 15 on day three to get an inch, inch and a quarter of precip onto your soil down deep. And that's, a, that's called a deep soak, okay? And we do that about once a month maybe less on an established garden, especially coastal, you'll get a feel for it. And you do it in anticipation of a heat event in the summer. Not, good farmers are not playing catch up. Now, are there surprises? Yes, but not so much in Southern California. Our weather's pretty predictable. We kind of know what's gonna happen next week or certainly within the next three or four days. We're, we're, they ain't Idaho. It doesn't change this afternoon. In Idaho, they say, you know, if you don't like the weather, just wait 10 minutes, it'll change. Um, we don't have that. So, so when you see the news saying, hey, it's going to get hotter in Hades in about four days, heat wave coming, and your garden is about due for a deep soak, that's when you soak it. Okay, during the cool overcast, June gloom, May, even in July, we get gray weather. That's when you water. Then the heat wave hits, and you're confident that your soil is moist deep down. But the story continues. Those are deep soaks that are done on large, long intervals. But what we're really finding helps in the world of gardens, and it makes you feel good too, are what we call refreshing sprinkles. And this is where it gets fun, because now in the afternoon, late when the sun is low but not down and you're tired and it's been a hot day and you come home or whatever and you stand out in the garden with a with a with this but even better would be one of those pistol things with a hose and you just wet down the whole garden okay including the, the soil the mulch on the soil the leaves and everything and I, and I mean this seriously, turn it straight up overhead and let it come down on you, fully clothed. It'll feel great and you'll get to see and feel what the plants are feeling because they're cooling off immediately at 6 p.m. on a summer day. You can do this two or three times a week. You, there's, there's like, this is cool stuff because the plant, all, even natives with their waxy leaves and their drought strategies, strategies for drought, they do absorb water through their leaves. 
You don't want to do this so that the water burns through little droplets and makes burn spots like little magnifying glass in the day. These aren't tropical plants. They don't want rain coming down on them when it's 100 degrees out. But on a hot day, a native garden, here's this, this California Bay. Here's, here's a trick I'm going to share with all of you that has worked for me my whole life. You take a bay leaf, especially when you're hiking. I like to fold it to get all those oils out. And then I put it in my hat, and I don't get a headache. Now, I don't get headaches anyway, but I don't get a headache with a bay leaf in my So it seems to be working. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was I saying? Bay leaf is waxy and is built to conserve water. But it will absorb water in the late afternoon when you do these refreshing sprinkles. It will also probably sunburn or get some salt residue and look funky if you do this at the wrong time of day. So no refreshing sprinkles in the heat of the day, only in the late afternoon. And, bef and in time so that the leaves will con completely dry before it gets night, because some other plants, heuchera and a few others, iris, can uh, get some rots going, some, some fungi uh, and, and other things that, that they don't like if they're sitting there with moisture on the leaf on a warm night. Because this is contrary to what they get in nature. They don't get rained on in the late afternoon. So we want them to sort of dry out before nightfall. What this does, though, is that this plant has been toughen it out during a long day at 95 degrees and holding on to all its moisture and then nightfall and it starts to change the way it breathes. Look, at if you're a scientist, I'm sorry. Plants don't breathe. They transpire. I get it. But um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's opening and closing little windows that keep the water in and out and the air coming. Okay. It's happening, believe me. And it takes all night. Kevin's shaking his head. <laughs> he, by the way, does have a master's degree in science. Um, <laughs> we call him Dr. Dr. Science around here. Uh, but for that plant and that leaf to cool off fully, it, it takes until like 3 in the morning, OK? And then, it, and then here, because we get coastal influence, and you know we're not Riverside, and maybe some of you are, and you don't get as much coastal influence. But in this zone, it freshens up, and the plant, by three, it's back to normal. It's kind of happy. And, and then, you know, three hours later, there comes the sun, and it's like, oh, no, you know, again. And it's like that all summer long. But here cometh you with your hose, and you cool that leaf down instantly at 6 p.m. the day before. It goes to bed so happy. It's just like, oh, yeah, it has this really good night. And, and when it wakes up, you're, it's rocking. This, this really works to keep the plants super happy, and it doesn't use much water. Because I want you to know this, you're not watering. There's no water making it into the root zone. Okay? At best, the mulch is staying fresh and, and moist. The leaves are getting washed off and cooled off. And, and you feel good about it, and you get to see the hummingbird come, take a bath in the stream of water, and the butterflies off yonder, and you turn it overhead and get wet. And you know, it, it's, it's the equivalent of my dad when he was tired at the end of the long day, popping a beer and going out onto his lawn, which was immaculate because I did all the weeding. And this was before we had sprinkler system, and he'd water. And it would take him an hour. And it was like no TV, no wife, no kids, no. It was like his beer and his hose and his lawn. And I think it was therapeutic. I really do. Well, we, in the native plant world, it's like, hey, put on the time clock, turn it on the sprinklers, walk away. These plants don't need any care. You know, this is for you and for them. So the refreshing sprinkle combined with the deep soak, and you will have an easy way to take care of native plants as far as watering is concerned in the summer. Yes? So we make these for your convenience. They now look like this because the, the saddle thing has changed. But this is actually a product of agriculture. This came out of Israel originally, and it's used mostly in vineyards in long, long rows. And they water efficiently their wine grapes with this. And then when it's time to harvest or cultivate or weed or feed or get in with an equipment, they just roll this thing up, get it out of the way, and they've got an open field, no pipes, no sprinkler heads, no nothing. So it's called a drag line. 
and that, thank you, that brings up a point. We also make them with, their, they are uh, 10 feet apart or so, and you can buy them with three, four, five in a row and snake it through your garden and water a bigger area than just one. So I did forget to mention that, and you reminded me that uh, th this drag line can be, how's yours working out? Excellent. You use it, right? No leak, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just move it and you get a sense for where, how, it, how the water's soaking in. Right, perfect. And then come October, if we get into any kind of normal weather at all, you're just going to roll it up and put it in your garage. You know, you're not going to need it at all for the for the winter. Yes. So you're saying you sell these? Yes. Like here, like a uh huh. Um, question for you. So for I know we're talking a lot about water and like what the plants use are. It sounds like that was all for like once they're established. Yes. As you're establishing them, do you need to do these deep soaks like once a week? Absolutely. It's such a good question. Thank you. But you're going to do it with this. So that's going to put you in contact with the plant. There's no, there's, there's no, I can't overemphasize how important it is to hand water a new garden. You, you're going to hand water the root ball and the surrounding area around that basin because that's where the roots are. And then if you have a sprinkler system, you're going to use it on the deep soak method. But if you're watering out here, it's kind of academic. It's nice to keep the moisture out there because remember we want this soil to call out to these roots, come on over, try me. But, but that deep soak, three week, four week interval, this plant will die in, the in, in that period because the roots are all here and that root ball will dry out. So you need to be watering once a week. Uh, and I wouldn't say so much once a week as put your finger down in here and if it's moist, it doesn't need water and if it's dry, it needs water. Getting toward dry, not even dry. And it balances out to about once a week. You did this too, right? Yeah. And how often? Uh, roughly. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was probably like uh, at the, the initial three months, maybe twice a week, mm -hmm. and then now it's more like once a week. Yeah, so they just got a brand new garden and they're working on, you know, and it's looking like a million bucks, by the way. And you're doing everything right. That's why it's looking like a million bucks. But to do it right is not that difficult, what we're describing here, and it's fun. That's the main thing. You're out in the garden productive with your little garden, with your hose. And you get good at it, and you get to... <laughs> And you get to start sensing what's happening in your garden. How, how dry is it or is it not? You know, you know exactly at any given moment. You can tell me right now where the dry spots are in your garden, where you're going to have to hit next. You, and you're not there. You're here. But I know how that works because you've got this reciprocal relationship with your garden. It's a cool thing. It's, it's sometimes cool. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night knowing how dry certain parts of the nursery are, and it's really bad. Yes? Okay, that's a great question, for sure. Well, you're going to see growth on the surface. Uh, huh? Repeat the question. Oh, the, sorry. At what point do you know that the plants are established and you're going to transition from this hand watering, this individual care, to the deep soak over the entire garden area? There's kind of a, a, a it might be sort of a slow um, uh, tr uh, uh, transition that, that uh, t some plants are going to be established and some might still need that occasional um, extra water with the hose. So it's not just, you know, like a switch on off, but you'll see that the plants themselves have put on branch growth and new leaves and they've got a bigger canopy in there. And that's an indication that, you know, things are going well down out and about. They start touching each other. Um, it, it's almost intuitive, but it's a great question. You, it's, it, technically it's about between three to six months. Um, based on the time, on, depending on the time of year that you plant. In other words, if you, that's why I'm recommending planting in the fall. Because if you plant in the fall, the winter rains are going to, if there are any ever again, are going to um, take care of you pretty much. You might have to do some spot watering by hand, but the winter rains are going to get your plants established. Come February, March, you're, it starts to get a little longer days and a little, little warmer, so you're going to keep track of it. And then by um, um, April, May, June, the, the garden is truly established. So at that point, with, with, a, um, with a fall planting, you do have a, uh, a, a, a very easy transition. You're, you're not doing a lot of hand watering because the rains are doing it for you. With a spring planting or a planting right now, and, and if you want to do this, plant now by all means. I didn't mean to make it sound like you can't plant now. I'm just saying 
If you're not ready and you want to just get everything looking good and, and just plant a few things between now and October, it's easier. But if you were to plant now, you literally would have to be hand watering those plants for four to six months, you know, because they're not going to get established to the point where you can do the deep soak because the first deep soak that would that might be possible is August and uh, and you still want to be watching each root ball so plus the plants grow faster during the cool season many of the native plant in general they don't go dormant per se they kind of shut down they just sort of out in the wild they, they do stop growing for the most part and they and they're just sort of holding on you know what happens in the, in the wild places, God, I'm looking across the way and it's just looking so bad. It's just this is wrong color for May. It's very sad. That fire in Laguna was an indica in, in indication of how dry everything really is. The grasses over there are brown. You know, I can see them going brown about now, but brown, they've been brown for three weeks. Um, what what uh, happens out in the wild is that as the days get longer and drier, and there's no more rain, the plants, our native plants have all developed strategy for coping and, it, and, it, and it's like hardening their leaves, um, dropping a few leaves. Some like Manzanita, Toyo, I mean uh, Jojoba and others, they actually start to turn their leaves more up vertical like this, just for the summer so the sun doesn't hit the surface of the leaf so directly. There's the, uh, um, forming more, a thicker waxy cuticle. There's, there's so many different strategies that, are, that are, plants are doing out in the wild that um, allow them to make it through the summer without water. But the, again, these are, and they, they, for the most part, are not growing very fast. But these are established plants. Any plant that's going to germinate, like a new toyon, a new lemonade berry or something, is going to germinate during the rainy season or just after and going to stay hunkered down that first summer. So, Establishing the plant with a hand watering is easy and fun. Okay, then we get into just, we're just finishing up here. Fertilizer, we talked about pruning. You can look at our this month in the natural garden and see what to do all the time. But basically the only pruning things that you're doing consistently are the removal of dead branches, if any, and down and diseased. I saw on my son-in-law's beautiful manzanita in San Diego, one branch that was starting to go down because of a branch dieback, it's a fungal disease that they get in the wild and not to freak out, but I, I broke it off. It was already not um, green, it wasn't yet brown. I told him, hey, that, that little branch twig is goner. I don't like to prune it. I just like to break those off. I like to snap off the manzanita if it has a dead or dying branch. I just think that the pruning well, first of all, now you've got shears that are contaminated, so you've got to clean them. And also, I think that break allows for the plant to sort of compartmentalize the disease and, and, um, and, and not let it spread. Uh, but, uh, so you're take, pruning down disease, d d d dead branches all the time. Some thinning, but usually that's done in the fall and winter, not in the summer. And then some heading back, which means um, taking off the, uh, the outside edge, especially with uh, the old flower heads of ceanothus, sunflower, buckwheat, etc. And then there's a thing that we just, I saw Kevin put it on, the, on, the, uh, on Instagram. <laughs> there you are. The, hey Mike, on, on, oh, on, on heading back. What was it on? Deadheading. Okay, <laughs> you gotta see that. Grateful Dead are, are, are properly um, honored. So, so this is called pinching. And so when I see plants that are in April, May that are growing this vigorously, I can go stop my, whatever I'm doing for a minute and take my thumbnail and my forefinger and take out this little growing bud, okay? And in doing so, you can hardly tell I came by, okay? The plant hasn't changed a bit. But all these buds in the branch here called lateral buds are now stimulated to grow because the terminal bud, the one on the end, has been removed. And that allows the plant to become more bushy. And you can do this any time, really, to keep plants 
you don't have to do it with trees. I mean, I want this bay to get up tall, unless I didn't. If I was trying to keep this bay as a little shrub, I'd come in here right now and pinch it, you know? And there's the, there's the uh, and I don't want to waste those. Those are good for headaches. Um, <laughs> prevention of. So pinching, especially on fast growing plants in the spring and early summer, is a very effective pruning technique. Um, if you have wet areas, there are plants for those. Extreme sun, if you're planting and you see a heat wave coming, you want to provide some temporary shade the best you can, a little screen. I've used a fan palm leaf, okay? So go to your neighbor's house, find a fan palm, take a couple leaves off, all right? Or out in the street or some, you know, Mexican fan palm, they're everywhere. So the petiole, that's the stem of the leaf, is a nice little stake, and you can stick that in the ground and make a tent around your brand new plant or around the plant that might sunburn because of the extreme weather or it's new or in a new place or, you know, figure it out. You need to protect this thing from sun for a few, <laughs> that away, TJ, you show him, um, for a few, uh, a few days or a couple weeks. You can, you can do it, figure out how to make a little screen, especially from the afternoon sun. Treat each plant individually and they'll uh, be very grateful for your, for your, your, your care. Um, yes? Uh -huh. Is there a direction that we want to have plants going? We, for example, we have a coffee berry, and it's, it's, you know, some of those branches are going down to the ground, and they're uh -huh. on the ground. Do we want to clip those off, or is it, you know, I think in my mind it's always, no, we don't want branches on the ground, but is that true for natives? Well, that's a general, they, yes, that's very much true, and there is a direction. I think plants, like wood has a grain when you see it on a piece of lumber. Plants have a grain. Um, if you looked at this plant carefully now and see, I, I can guarantee you it was growing like that because our sun, more about like that, because our sun goes like this, you know, over there, kind of in the southern part of the sky, and there's where those leaves are facing. I can tell you right now this plant was in the, in the nursery was growing like that. This one, it's easy. I even turned this around for the camera when we, when we first um, started. You, you look at, look at this. That's its backside, right? I mean, I, I, hey, it's a plant. I mean, but it's it's accustomed to the to the sun's patterns. So if you can detect that on your planting site, that that's cool. Most plants can adapt. If you put them in crooked, it's not going to wipe them out. But some plants are so slow growing that I really am careful to get the grain right when I'm planting them. Jojoba, manzanita, I always try to get the grain right on those. Um, so that's something about direction. And that said, in the garden, a lot more branches are going to be out there because that's where the light is and the sun's patterns. You might have to trim them off more consistently to get to try to stimulate. If you're looking for a balanced shape, you're going to want to stimulate growth over here on the shady side. So you might have to do more. And so you are definitely trimming to a bud that's going in the direction you want it to go. Like this little tip prune here, I don't know if you can see it, but we took off the tip. But the bud, and I didn't take it off right at the bud because that would damage that bud. I took it off about eighth of an inch above. So that little stem will die down. That little bud will stay alive. And that bud happens to be going in the direction I want it to go, out. So you, you do uh, definitely, through pruning, shape the plant you know, right now as, as the pruning is taking place. And then you're shaping it in its, in its big picture because you're pruning to a bud that's going in whatever. If I wanted this to come back this way, I don't have my pruners on me, but I'd cut that right there. And, and then that, that would take that branch back, the next growing branch over to where um, it belonged. Yeah. Pretty much, I mean, yeah, yeah, it just so happens that I'm here and you're there and the sun's out there. But yes, that's, I, see how the leaves are all, yeah, the, the surface of the leaf that, that catches the light is, is here. If I turn it around again, you can see that, yeah, see, so it, it's pointing, and, you know, that's just, we know, you know, our sun's patterns. Obviously in the summer, the sun is higher overhead. And it's, but in the winter, of course, our plants lean more toward the, the southern sky because that's where the sun's arc is. Thank you. Phototropic, y'all. Told you he was a scientist. Photo meaning light, tropic meaning movement, right? Thank you. 
It's called phototropic. That's the word of the day. <laughs> to the point where when we are taking a plant out of one place and moving it to another, like a plant that that can be done with, I'm talking about cultivated plants, not stealing them out of the wild. Let's say we want to move a cactus plant. We tag, and that's a slow growing plant that's very phototropic and has gotten over 10 years or 20 or 50 used to the sun. We tag a certain side of the plant, let's call it north, then we remember, we tagged the north side. And then we take it to the new planting side and we put it in just like it was at the old, at the old site. Okay. So, so that it doesn't have to like figure out a brand new hemisphere. And that works. And it works for little plants too, when possible, whenever possible. So kind of look for the grain in plants when you buy some little, little posy like a, like a seaside daisy or something, it doesn't really matter, okay? You just put it in the ground. But with shrubs, sometimes you can see. And what if you don't want it facing this way? What if this is the front of, and you want, then turn it around and call this the front and let the plant figure it out. It's not gonna die. That, that, okay, so deal, you know? Make new branches over there. <laughs> All right. I think that we've covered everything in this book and a lot of really good questions, troubleshooting, is here, look at, when you, when you establish a native plant garden and it's thriving on its own, and I'm finding now after like only four or five years of recommending this method called deep soak with refreshing sprinkle, because this is kind of new for us, five years or so that we've coined those terms, that really helps on, the, on, the, on pests. That refreshing sprinkle not only gets you out there, if, they, if you're doing it and you see some aphids, you know, a little brand new colony of aphids just right here on the, on this, you just put your hand right here, you just take that pistol and you blast them to smithereens. They go off into the wild blue yonder and, and party's over for them. You, so it's, but, it, but the sprinkles also prevent a lot of sucking mouth part in, insects and other pests that can get a stronghold in a dry garden, spider mite, things like that. And these, so I, I hope we're all coming home with the idea that Native plant gardens are not ones you just walk away from, abandon, they're on their own, they're native, they don't require any care. Uh, I signed up for low maintenance, I hate that term. First of all, maintenance is what you do to your car, not your garden. And low maintenance, why? Why? I mean, look at the great horticultural uh, countries and regions of the world, Japan, England of old, I don't know if it, now, they might be getting more like us. But I mean, like, gardening shows were on prime time, you know? <laughs> this, this, was, this was like a, a part of their culture. And, um, and of course, Japan has a millennia of, of fantastic horticulture and other parts, of, and even America. I mean, there were garden clubs, there still are. I love the old garden, I hope they don't die on the vine. The, the, there is a culture of gardening that, that, um, that proves that maintenance, or I call it care, is uh, worth it because as we started, you get something back out of it, which is wellness. If you take care of a vegetable garden, you get vegetables. If you take care of a rose garden, and my dad was a great rosarian and I love roses, you bring roses into the house in the vase. There's something that comes back, but those are more tangible. If you take care of a na natural garden, a native plant garden, you just get wellness and you'll get some cut flowers and you'll get some fruit and you, you know, you can, all of, all of the above, but you mostly get this, this, this sense of wellness and healing that only comes with garden. Really quick, a few books. This is called a flora. It has, book, it has plants that are native and wild. It's for people that are wanting to identify plants in wild places, species that grow wild. It's a very valuable resource in California or in anywhere that has a flora, but it's very, um, it, you can only apply it to horticulture uh, so, because it has the ceanothus in it that grow in California, but it won't have many of the cultivars and um, named varieties of ceanothus that are available to you in the trade. To get to that, you have to go to horticultural books like um, this one, California Native Plants for the Garden, or this one about designing. And then we have a set of flashcards that I was actually on the committee that helped this. This is great for plant ID and for use of plants in the native plant in the Southern California landscape. And there are 80 approximately 80 cards here, but it's only genus 
genus is the first word of the scientific name, as you recall. So for all the salvia, the sage that are out there, and there might be 30 of them that we grow, you get one card, salvia. And then you know, so, so from, from a standpoint of plant ID, you use this, here's ornamental strawberry, fragaria. You use these flashcards with a lot of horticultural information written in two languages on the back, and you get a lot of information. But if you want to know which species or which variety of salvia or penstemon it is, because there might be four or five penstemon that are in the nurseries, then, y'all, you got the whole internet in your pocket, okay? I've watched everybody do it. They take a picture, they send it off somewhere, and here comes the name. It's pretty amazing. Last story, and I'll quit. I was out with a colleague here at the nursery, Randy, one day about three years ago, and we were in a wild place. We were collecting seed. And I'm walking around this plant that I could not remember the name of. Remember, plants have genus and species. That's how we call plants and all living organisms. And I'm just, and it's got yellow flowers, and, it's a, and I can remember it's a broom. That's the common name. And it's a scale broom. That's the common name. And, and for the life of me, I could not remember it, and I'm walking around, and she's wanting to know, and we were getting some other seeds here and there, and it was a good day out in the Riverside County, the dry hills, in this creek bed, and uh, this voice comes out of the sky like an angel, and she says, Lepidus fartum squamatum, with a little question mark, and I looked around, and I said, what? And see, I was pretty new to, the, to this, and, uh, <laughs> and she had done that, you know? And where'd you get that? Oh, iNaturalist. I said, I thought you were texting your daughter or taking a picture. And they said, oh, I was doing that too. <laughs> so as far as technology and all the information available to you, it's there and it's awesome. But it is only what it is, OK? I am of the belief that things like Calflora, which is a website that talks about how many native plants grow within a certain distance from you, and then therefore you can plant them in your garden. Uh, I don't use it. Now, I also know plants, so I feel I don't need to, but neither do you. You can use it as a guide, as an idea, to get you started on what an ecosystem around you would look like. But from a horticultural point of view, don't forget, unless you're telling the story of just this, my immediate surroundings, a website like Calflora won't help you because it won't bring in ideas of plants from other parts of the state that you want to use to tell your story. So use the, the websites and the technology and the plant ID and the iNaturalist all day long. It's wonderful technology. Just every now and then, turn it off and put it in your pocket and go pull some weeds, <laughs> water some plants, and get connected that way. So the connection here is valid and valuable, but it does not compare to the connection that you're going to get once you start taking care of your garden on this care and create. All right, any other questions? Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Sorry if I went too long. We didn't officially start till about 10. Yes.